We're in the eighth week of the sermon series, the final chapter. Everyone say the final chapter. Can we do a quick recap? Through this series, we're walking through the book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible, like the final chapter of a book. And like many great authors, Jesus saves the best for last. He reveals it all in the final chapter. Revelation is Jesus' last recorded words, and his last recorded words are more relevant today than ever before. His last words are relevant for the last days. And how many believe we're living in those, those days? We're living in the last days. And remember, Revelation means to make known or to reveal. God revealed the last days to John through a vision. Can you imagine when all of this takes place and it's no longer a vision for John? I mean, think about it. John saw it in a vision, but he's going to be able to see it with his own eyes. Wow. And I wonder what it will be like for us. Because remember, this is after the rapture of the church, so we'll be in heaven. So will we be able to see all that is happening on earth? I don't know. Possibly. Will we, will we be sitting in a big AMC theater with popcorn and watching the end of time? Think about it. I mean, that's something to think about. How will we experience it when we're in heaven and the end of days as we know it comes to pass will God give us heavenly eyes to be able to see through and to see all that has taken place and will we be able to see our family members our loved ones and, and all that is those that are left behind what will it be like how will we experience it in heaven as the raptured church God is revealing the last days to his church through his word God has given us great revelation in this hour of history how many would agree that God is truly revealing things through his word and through prophecy being fulfilled God is giving the church revelation in this hour of history Jesus said, my sheep hear and know my voice. And remember, he said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is speaking to the church. He's not being silent. He is speaking to us. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. How many have ears this morning? Let me see your hands. How many can hear? Shout amen. amen. So apparently you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Church, are you ready to receive what God is ready to reveal? God has been getting the church ready to receive what he is getting ready to reveal in this hour of history. And oh, am I ready? So let me ask you again, are you ready to receive? Well, let's jump into the word. Let's jump into the word. Revelation chapter 8 verse 6. And John said, then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them, initiating the judgments. I want to go back old school, go to the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. And the prophet said, Blow the trumpet in Zion, warning of impending judgment. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble and shudder in fear. Fear isn't always a bad thing. For the judgment day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. Can we pray? Father, we come before you as our God and our Savior. Oh God, we thank you for the revelation. We thank you for speaking to your church. We thank you that we have ears to hear. And God, I pray that you would anoint this word from beginning to end, from the very first word to the last. Every scripture, every point, every illustration, every part of this sermon, God, don't just anoint the deliverer, but anoint the hearer. And anoint those who are viewing and listening online today, God. Anoint our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive your word. We're ready. Speak. In your mighty name, everyone says, Amen. Amen. 
Amen. The title of my sermon today is Blow the Trumpet. Everyone say, Blow the Trumpet. These seven trumpets are very symbolic. These trumpets are the third sevenfold series spoken of in the book of Revelation. First, we had the seven letters to the seven churches. And we looked at those during the sermon series, Ecclesia. Remember the sermon series, Ecclesia? How many enjoyed that series? Then go back and listen to every sermon over and over and over. It's available on YouTube. And then we looked at the seven seals. And today we're going to begin to look at the seven trumpets. And these trumpets will reveal but also release the judgment of God on the earth. And the judgment that is released with these trumpets is far greater than the judgment that is released with the seals. The severity of the judgment intensifies with each series. One-fourth of the earth is affected by the seals, yet one-third of the earth is affected by the trumpets. But get this, the bowls affect the entire earth. But don't forget that this is after the rapture of the church. Can somebody praise God for that? We'll be raptured out of here, y'all. In fact, somebody needs to break out and do the hallelujah shake. Not, not the Harlem shake. I said the hallelujah shake. <laughs> and yeah, I just made that up, Tasha. It's going to go viral. Don't worry. I, I just posted the video of what it looks like. So go on to my Facebook and, and look at that. That's what, it, that's what the hallelujah shake looks like. <laughs> One fourth of the earth would be about two billion people can you imagine two billion people being affected by the seven seals one third of the earth would be about would be over two and a half billion people Hmm. but think about this what will the population on planet earth be after the rapture of the church well come on think about it how many of us are going to be raptured out of here while we don't know exactly what that number will be we do know that it will greatly decrease the population on planet earth and praise God for that what will it be according to a survey in 2010 there were 2.3 billion believers around the world can you imagine one third of the population 2.3 billion people being raptured out of here and meeting Jesus in the air what a day that will be when our Jesus we shall see oh I feel like somebody's about to jump up and do the hallelujah shake Rachel, Melinda Uh through the remaining chapters of Revelation God reveals what will take place during the end times. And as we rapidly approach such times, we need to be aware of the severity of the judgment that is to come. Maybe not for our sake, because we know where we stand in Christ. Amen? We'll be raptured out of here, y'all. But what, what about the people who won't be? For their sake, we need to understand the severity of the judgment that is to come. Church, our only escape... From the judgment to come is Jesus Christ. And I believe that's the greatest revelation that the world needs to hear from the church today. Jesus Christ, through the cross of Calvary, provided a way of escape from the judgment to come. That's what the world needs to hear. That's the trumpet that the church needs to be blowing in this hour of history while we still have the time to blow it. Point number one, you might want to write this down. This is a long one. God revealed the severity of his judgment to reveal the significance of his message. I said God reveals the severity of his judgment in the word to reveal the significance of his message. How significant is the message of the cross to your life? Now let's apply it to your eternity. How significant is the message of the cross to your eternity 
Could you even rate it this morning? It's just as significant for the people who surround you. For lost family members, maybe a spouse, a coworker, a classmate, a neighbor. What about a prodigal child? It's just as significant for them. They need the message of salvation. In this hour of history, it is of the utmost importance that the church proclaims the message of salvation to the world. Point number two, the world is in dire need of the word. And I want to say that again, but not just to emphasize the point, because it's a great point. But I want you to understand how dire the need truly is in this moment in history. The world, come on, your world, the people who live in your world is in dire need of the word today. The people you live with is in dire need of the word. The people you share life with, give me camera two, please. The people that you love dear is in dire need of the word. Can you put a face and a name on those people this morning? How significant is the message of salvation to them? Come on. Well, just give me a church nod. Let this hit home. Put a face, a name. Bless you. Is it a prodigal child? Is it your spouse? Come on, what about a parent? A neighbor? A co worker? A classmate? The Apostle Paul said in Romans 10 14, but how will people call on him in whom they have not believed? But let's make this personal. What people? What people is the Apostle Paul talking about? Your people. How many have people this morning? How many have people in your circle that don't know Christ, that aren't in church, that aren't saved, that God forbid, but if the rapture was to take place today, they would be left behind? How many have those kind of people in your life? Those people is who the Apostle Paul is talking about. And he goes on to say, And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher or a messenger? And if we're going to make this personal, who is the messengers? You are. In Revelation chapter 8 verse 6 in the voice translation these angels are referred to as heavenly messengers they're heavenly messengers and the bible says that they raise their trumpet come on i want you to get a visual image of this they raise their trumpets and the bible says they begin to prepare to sound them what would that look like and how long were they standing ready to blow their trumpets think about it how long did they have to wait? Think of the anticipation of waiting for the Father to say, it's time, blow the trumpet. They might have looked like this. And I'm going to hold it. We have some angels about to pass out in heaven waiting for the Father to say, it's time, blow the trumpet. It's time. Throughout the Bible, trumpets were used to announce important events, to signal something that was coming, and to sound an alarm. But they were also symbolic for a person's voice. John said in Revelation 1.10, I heard behind me a loud voice that sounded like a trumpet. <laughs> 
How does a voice sound like a trumpet, by the way? Is it loud? Is it high? <laughs> and in Revelation 4, 1, he said, The voice I heard speaking to me was like a trumpet. So a trumpet is also symbolic for a voice. And the prophet Joel said, Blow the trumpet. So what is he really saying spiritually? Speak. Take it back to the Apostle Paul. How will they hear if you never speak? If you never blow your trumpet? If, if you just expect the pastor to blow his. If you just expect your neighbor or your mom or, or whoever, the, you know, them. Just let them handle it. That's not my personality, pastor. I can't do that. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Then you better believe you can do all things. And you can share the message of salvation because he said, don't worry about what to say. I'll give it to you in that moment. If you'll just step out in faith, he'll give you the words. Our response is to step out. Just open up your mouth, even if you sound like a, an idiot. Just, just open up your mouth. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Who knows what the Holy Spirit does with your jumble of words into their ears? I get up here and preach sermons, and after 10 people come to me and say, this hit me, this hit me, I said, I didn't even say that. But the Holy Spirit allowed them to hear that in the moment. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. He takes the words of this idiot and transforms it into powerful, life-giving words. That's the way God works. He said, I choose the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Right? Mm. Just let him work through you. Step out in faith and speak. Blow the trumpet. Blow your trumpet. And then in Revelation 8, 2, John said, the seven angels were given seven trumpets note the word given the angels or the heavenly messengers were given a trumpet I want to make a point here Becky why were they given a trumpet come on to hold it to polish the brass to carry it around to look cool like a band nerd I just had to throw that in there my wife was a flute playing varsity cheerleader in high school. Can you imagine her hot self in a cheerleading outfit with a trumpet on, or a flute on her back? <laughs> Clarinet? I can't even remember. She played one of those brass <laughs> instruments. What was it? What'd you play? Clarinet, okay. Well, however you hold it, she was walking around with her cheerleading outfit, pom-pom in one hand and a clarinet in the other. She should have tr played the trombone. That would have made her look really cool. <laughs> Church, the angels, the heavenly messengers were given a trumpet for one purpose and one purpose only, to blow it. Nothing else. God has given each of us a spiritual trumpet. How many know you have a trumpet today? What is your trumpet? Your voice. You have a spiritual trumpet, and it is your voice. But what's the point of having a voice if you never use it? Think about it. We are earthly messengers who've been given a message. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, to whom much is given, much is required. We are required to give what we've been given. You are required to speak what you've heard. And how many would say that God has given the church great revelation in this hour of history? But for what? To hold it? To polish it? Carry it around? sound like religious nuts to just preach it to one another absolutely not to proclaim it to the world to proclaim it to our lost family members to proclaim it to those people in our life who are lost to 
proclaim it. The prophet Joel said, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, for the day of the Lord is coming. And then he closed the verse with, it is close at hand. We should be echoing the words of the prophet today. The church should be echoing these words louder and louder. This is the message that God gave the prophet. And this is the message that the prophet proclaimed. He said, blow the trumpet, for the day of the Lord is at hand. How many know that God has given us the same message today? It hasn't changed. Blow the trumpet, church. The day of the Lord is at hand. God has given us the same message. It's a message that offers great hope, but also carries a strong warning. For too long, the church has tried to offer hope without the warning. And we might look at a warning as a bad thing, but in actuality, a warning is a great thing. How many are thankful for warning labels and warning signs? Hold up. Because of kids, the elderly, and stupid people. Anyone? Like the warning label that reads, hot, do not touch. How many parents are thankful for that warning label? Yeah? Or what about the warning sign that says, road is closed because the bridge is out? Without the warning sign, you and your car might have ended up at the bottom of the Missouri River. How many are thankful for warning signs? Okay, how about this? How many wish that the jerk you dated would have came with a warning sign? (laughs) Come on, ladies. Or the substance that you were addicted to or are addicted to came with a warning label. Just trying to be real. Everything we buy today comes with a warning label. And apparently, it's needed. (laughs) Like the warning label that says, caution, hot coffee is hot. Hello. (laughs) Isn't that what you just bought? Or how about this one? There's a warning label on a baby stroller that says, please remove baby before folding stroller. (laughs) It's actual warning label, I promise Google it. Or how about this one? Do not hold the wrong side of a chainsaw. Wow. But you do know why these ludicrous warning labels are needed, right? Because someone, somewhere, actually folded their baby stroller before removing their baby, and then they sued the stroller company. Church, warning signs and warning labels aren't just needed for stupid people. We all need them. King David said in Psalms 1911, in the Message Bible, God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. He warns us to direct us. Come on, think about it. He warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way? The voice translation says, your servant will find hidden in your commandments both a strong warning and a great reward for keeping them. God warns us to direct us. So thy word is a lamp unto our feet and also a warning to our feet. Don't go there. He warns us to direct us. The word does offer great hope, but it comes through strong warnings. And again, the American church has gotten good at offering hope without the warnings. But our hope, our only hope, is by obeying the warnings of the word. Joel 2.12. That is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Everyone say, while there is time. This is key. While there is time. Let your remorse tear at your hearts and not your garments. In other words, let it be deeper than an emotional snot and Balling at the altar. It it can't just be, it has to be a true commitment. A true commitment made in the heart. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He is not easily angered. He is full of kindness and anxious not 
to punish you. Notice it says anxious not. He's not anxious to punish you. He's anxious not because he's a merciful, he's a graceful, he's a loving, he's a patient God who is not anxious to punish us. God told the prophet Joel to blow the trumpet to warn the people. What is the warning? Time is running out. Hope can only come through obeying the warning. Think about it. Hope can only come through obeying the warnings of the word. In verse 13, the prophet echoed the words from God from Exodus 34, 6, which says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Our God is a God of grace, love, and mercy. Our God is a God of love, grace, and forgiveness. And as a pastor, that's what I must preach because that's who God is. He is a God who is loving, He is graceful, and He is ready to forgive. But at the same time, church, His love, His justice, and His forgiveness is bound to His truth, His justice, and His holiness. His love is bound to His truth. His grace is bound to His justice, and His forgiveness is bound to His holiness. You can't have one without the other. Truth is in love remember the apostle Paul said to preach the truth in love or speak the truth in love the father loves us enough to warn us his grace is to change us point number three we're forgiven for redemption not repetition come on let that hit home for a moment we're forgiven for Redemption, not repetition. Forgiveness comes through repentance, and repentance means to what? Turn from. Not to go back to, but to turn from. Grace doesn't say stay. No, grace says change your ways. Grace brings repentance, which leads to salvation and then sanctification. See, the proper cycle is this. Sin, grace, repent, forgiven, and redeemed. That's the proper cycle from salvation to sanctification. Can I say it again? Sin, grace, repent, forgiven, and redeemed. But this is the cycle we, too, we see often in the church world today sin grace repent forgiven and repeat sin grace repent forgiven and repeat and it's a cycle it's over and over and over but we're forgiven for redemption not the repetition of over and over that's almost abusing His grace, church. Our response to His love is to remember His truth. Your response to His grace is to remember His justice. And our response to His forgiveness is to remember His holiness. The prophet Joel said, Blow the trumpet because the day of the Lord is coming. He said it's a day of darkness and gloom. This day refers to the seven-year tribulation where the seals are broken, the trumpets are blown, and the bowls are poured out. Poured out. This is the wrath of God. And while the church won't experience this because we'll be raptured out of here, right? People we know will. I said people you know will. People you live with, people you do life with, people you love will experience this. Over the past six months, through the last three sermon series, is Ears to Hear, Ecclesia, and the final chapter. 
God was getting us ready to receive what he is getting ready to reveal. In this hour of history, God has given us great revelation. See, it was no coincidence. We didn't plan this. It was ordained by God. God was getting the church ready to receive what he is getting ready to reveal and what he is getting ready to do, ultimately. God has given the church great revelation, the revelation of the last days, the revelation of what he is about to do and the revelation of what is about to take place on planet Earth. The prophet Amos in Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret plan of the judgment to come to his servants, the prophets. The voice translation says they are his spokespeople. We can call them his earthly messengers or trumpet blowers, whatever you want to call them. Throughout the Bible, before God did, he revealed. I said before God does, he always reveals. God always sent a warning before the coming judgment. Think about it. He warned Noah of the coming flood. He warned Abraham of the coming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He warned Joseph of the coming seven-year famine. And through his word and through the prophecies that are taking place today, God is warning yet revealing his plans to his church. Because God will always reveal what is coming to his messengers. God is revealing. He has given us revelation in this hour of history. But again, what good is revelation if we do nothing with it? What good is revelation if we don't share it with the world? If we don't proclaim it? If we don't blow the trumpet? What good is it? What good is this revelation? If we just come to church and say amen and go home and never apply it to our lives or do anything with it what are we really doing how many would say that God has given us great revelation in this hour of history let me see your hands then in response to you raising your hand Jesus said Luke 12 48 to whom much is given much is required we are required to speak what we've been told we are required to give what we've been given And Jesus basically said in the parable of the talents, use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. And listen, church, it's not that, it might not be that we lose our voice. It might not be that we lose this revelation. It might be that we lose the opportunity to use our voice. It might be that we lose our platform to share this revelation if we're not proclaiming the word that God has given us and make it personal it might be that you lose the opportunity with that family member because you never step out in faith it might be that you you lose your platform point number four Warning, we are accountable to the revelation we've been given. I say, you are accountable to the revelation that you've been given. You will be held accountable, believer, with what you do or don't do with the revelation that you've been given. And this is a divine warning. Ezekiel 33, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against a land and the people of the land choose one of their men or women, make them their watchman or watchwoman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life 
and that person's life will be taken because of their sin but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood come on did that hit home for anybody today I will hold who accountable the watchman let me keep reading I've got some blank stares verse 7 son of man I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel so hear the word I speak and give them a warning from me when I say to the wicked you wicked person you will surely die and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways that wicked person will die in their sins and I will hold you who's you you accountable for their blood but if you do warn them to turn from their ways and they do not do so they will die for their sin though you yourself will be saved I mean no Christianity isn't just a me business it's a we it's us and if you don't have anybody in your life that's lost you're scotch free you don't have to open your mouth you don't have to blow your trumpet but if you're like the rest of us and you've got a lost person that surrounds you maybe co-worker, classmate, neighbor, spouse prodigal child parent you will be held accountable if you do not open your mouth and blow the trumpet do your best Isaiah the prophet said who will believe our message but I need you to know that it's not up to you to make them believe. You're not going to be held accountable if they believe or not believe. I'm not going to be held accountable as a pastor with those who don't believe. But if I will be held accountable if I don't preach the word that God gives me to preach. And the same is true for all of you. You will be held accountable if you don't preach the word to those people that are in your life. Blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet, Becky. Blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet, Sam. Terry, blow the trumpet. Judy, blow the trumpet. Dirk, blow the trumpet. It's not a time to be silent. It's a time to speak out. The world is in dire need of the Word of God in this moment, in this hour of history. Look around. They're confused. They're broken. They're lost. They need God. They need His Word. Blow the trumpet. We all carry the same calling. We're all called to be watchmen and watchwomen. Maybe not to nations, maybe not to kingdoms, but to cities, to communities, to neighborhoods, to families, to work environments, to school campuses to the people in our life. And just as God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel, he's speaking to us this morning. And what did he say? He says, speak to your people. You said you had people in your life that was lost. Speak to your people. Speak. Blow the trumpet. Share the love of Christ with them. You have a testimony whether you believe it or not. If you're saved set free and redeemed you have a testimony to share and it's through testimonies that the world will overcome the Bible says share your testimony so God said speak to your people he said warn your people young people God said warn your peeps warn the people in your life there are people in all of our lives that need to be warned this morning in Revelation 8, 6, the Bible says that the seven angels stand ready to blow their trumpets, but before these angels begin to blow theirs, the church needs to be running out of breath, blowing ours. We should be gasping for breath this morning. The church needs to be sounding the alarm. Believers should be blowing the trumpet. Can somebody blow a trumpet this morning? In verses 7 through 12, the Bible says four of the angels blow the trumpets, one after the other, releasing the judgment of God on the earth I want to put the focus on these trumpets for a few moments 
But I don't want to focus on what they bring, and not just because I don't fully understand all the symbology here, but I want to focus on their purpose. What is the purpose of these trumpets? That's the question that a believer should be asking when reading the book of Revelation. What is the purpose for these trumpets? Why is God taking the time to draw his judgment out in multiple phases? Think about it. After all, the church is already gone. We're already raptured out of here, y'all. Why don't God just go ahead and destroy everyone and everything that's left? I know I would. I'd just stomp on them like an ant. Thankfully, I'm not God. And I don't and have the grace and the mercy that the Father has. Why is God drawing judgment out? Why? Think about it. What is he waiting on? Why not wipe them out, God? Church, God did not create creation to destroy it. That was not his purpose. Think about it, parents. How many created your children to destroy them? Only one person in the back, but everyone else said, nope. We created them for another purpose, right? Now, they might make us wonder at times. They might, they might make me want to drive off of a cliff and destroy myself at times. Any parents? After 20 hours in the car, can you feel me? But we created them because we love them. We created them to love them. Think about it. Before the baby was born, you already fell in love. They weren't even in your arms. You were already deeply in love. And then when you were able to hold them in your arms, oh, the father's and a mother's heart just melts. We created them to parent them, to cherish them, to love them, to do life with them to be a part of their life, to be in relationship with them. And the same is true of our Heavenly Father. He created creation to love it, to cherish it, to parent it, to be in relationship with it. He didn't create creation to destroy it. Now let me tie all of this sermon together. I spent all of this time building up to this point. Why is the Father drawing out His judgment on the earth? The Father is drawing out His judgment out of His love. I said the Father, our Heavenly Father, is drawing out His judgment out of His love for creation, out of His love for His children. Our Father is compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to the saving knowledge of Him. He's a graceful, merciful, loving, patient Father. He's a good, good Father. And He's drawing out judgment for the sake of the lost, His lost prodigal children, His broken, addicted, bound children. It's messed up, jacked up, whatever you consider yourself this morning. <laughs> Out of love for you. He is graceful, merciful. The prophet Joel said in Joel chapter 2, verse 12, Yet even now, everyone say, yet even now. God gives the opportunity for the lost to repent and turn to Him, yet even now, even in the midst of the tribulation. Come on, think about it. The purpose of a trumpet throughout the Bible stays the same. It serves as a warning. It warns us of what is coming. It warns us that time is running out. And before these angels begin to blow their trumpets, the church should be going hoarse, blowing ours, because we have lost people in our life. In Revelation 8, 4, and I'm going to begin to close. The Bible says that the prayers of the saints went up to God. The mentioning 
of these prayers before the trumpet seem to indicate that the trumpets were in direct response to the prayers of the saints. In fact, many scholars say and believe that the trumpets are God's response to the saints' prayers. So we can say these trumpets are an answer to prayer. Come on, I'm giving you revelation right now beyond anything. I said these trumpets are an answer to prayer. But what prayers? Whose prayers? In verse 3, in the ESV, it says the prayers of all the saints. So all of the saints throughout time, their prayers. So maybe it was the prayers prayed for God's purpose and justice on earth. How many's prayed that before? Or maybe it was the prayers prayed by those who were martyred, asking God to avenge their blood. Maybe it was those prayers. But church, note that in some sense, God stores up our prayers. While he may not answer all of our prayers immediately, he doesn't dismiss them because he's a good, good father. But he stores them up until the proper time of fulfillment. He hears and he stores your prayers. So keep praying, brother. Oh, mom, keep praying for that prodigal child. Dad, don't give up. Keep praying. Don't give up on your mom. Don't give up on your dad. Don't give up on that spouse. Don't give up. Keep praying. Pray without ceasing. Listen, church, if God our Father, and he's a good, good Father, if God our Father answers our prayers for justice, how much more does he answer our prayers for mercy? mercy for those who haven't received him mercy for those who have rejected him over and over and over mercy for those who have taken advantage of his mercy mercy for those who are bound addicted broken jacked up mercy for those who feel like they've just messed up beyond healing. Mercy for your prodigal child, your lost spouse, your coworker, your son, your daughter, your mom, your, your grandfather, your best friend mercy he's a merciful God so he's drawing out his judgment out of mercy out of his love for his creation because he didn't create us to destroy us he created us to be in relationship to love us to cherish us to parent us. So can I say to you this morning, never give up on that person. Never stop praying for them. Because God forbid, but if they miss the rapture of the church, the grace of our loving Father gives them another opportunity to receive Him, to repent and to turn from their sin. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord does not delay as though we were un- He were unable to act and is not slow about His promise as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you. How I many thank God for His extraordinary patience toward us Not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance and to the saving knowledge of His Son. 
Praise God. If you have a lost family member, a prodigal child, a lost spouse, a parent, a friend, a coworker, a classmate, I want you to stand to your feet right now. And right now, I want you to begin to lift them up in prayer. Pray for mercy on their soul. Pray that the God who loves, the God who is graceful, the good, good Father, would have mercy. Pray for a divine appointment to be able to blow your trumpet, to speak life, to share your testimony. Our response is to pray and to blow the trumpet. Leave the results up to God. How many trumpet players, real trumpet players are in the house? One, two, three, four, five. I didn't know you were a trumpet player, Mary Lee. I want to hear it at the service. You don't have to be a gifted trumpet player. You just open up your mouth. Use your spiritual trumpet, which is your... Come on, help me out. Which is your voice? Blow the trumpet. It's that simple. Leave the results up to God. So right now, let's just take a few moments. Lift up that person. Call them out by name. Because remember, God doesn't dismiss your prayer. He hears it, and he stores it until the proper time of fulfillment. God, I pray for a divine appointment. I pray for a divine opportunity. I pray for a divine anointing. God, when I do open up my mouth, when that opportunity does come, when that appointment comes, and I'm able to speak and deliver my testimony and the message of salvation, to my lost family member, friend. God, bring them to me. God, bring them to me. Begin to work on their heart. Begin to woo them. Begin to speak to them. Begin to soften. And God, as I throw out the seed, as I blow the trumpet, as I proclaim your word, it hits a heart that is ripe and and ready to receive. It ultimately leads to salvation. Another child coming home. So God, every name that was spoken of in the last few moments in prayer, every person that was thought of, every family member, co-worker, classmate, we lift them up by name, God. And God, I pray for the opportunity while there's still time to blow the trumpet. God, we thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing to remembrance and to revelation people that are lost and need you. Lead us to a conversation. In your mighty name, we all pray.